before you came in, I was talking about how everyone's measurements of height and weight are some kind of conspiracy. Oh, yeah. I couldn't get anybody on board with that hot take, though. I didn't. I I, people, people weren't really. I'd uh, like to think it was. I try to. I don't want to think about the weight. No, 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 no. We won't. We won't think about that at all. On a Monday morning. No, don't think about that. We. Um, but I, I like what you say about preaching because because you, you're like you know you don't you you don't very much like to re-preach sermons. No. Because the expression that you use, I love it. Because you like it hot out of the oven. Mm -hmm. You want it to be fresh bread. Fresh bread. Oh yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. The uh, uh, obviously the word being our food. It's a good analogy. But I feel the same way about this podcast. We don't want to talk for thirty minutes and then. You know, uh, Jackie Gleason never, ever, no, never ever rehearsed. rehearsed the honeymooners, right. and it was one of. I mean, it's classic. Yeah. You can get on. I don't know Prime. I think, and you can get all of the. Oh, but he never would rehearse it. He well, said, I want it to be fresh. I want it to be, you know, and when they got stumped or something, they would improvise, absolutely. and it, it would be hilarious. So, Well, we're improvising this whole time, and obviously his comic wit pales in comparison to yours, so there's no way that we would, even, we would ever even think about rehearsing. Why would we rehearse this? I, had, um, some, I heard somebody say in passing last night, because there's more, you know, sadly enough, there's more and more people that actually watch this little podcast. <laughs> they, said, they said, you know, normally I what don't What else like is there to do on Monday morning? Nothing, nothing. Normally, normally, I think it, was it Greg Graves? I can't remember. He's like, normally I don't like the banter at the beginning of a podcast, but there's something about this one. It's just, I just want to <laughs> the, ba the banter. What is, what's another synonym for banter? Somebody, somebody get prattle? a thesaurus up real quick. Does and prattle work? What, what is another Light word chat? for banter? Brisk conversation. Rev Ah, <laughs> oh, uh, the Rev uh, Oh, that got me. That revved me up right there. I <laughs> got it warmed up. That French word. Nothing like a borrowed repartee. French word to get past or ready to go. <laughs> Man, we got a lot to talk about today. Well, we do. Weird you passage. Had a, you had a big. You had a big week this week. Oh gosh, I, I'm. I am. It was National Donut Day. I know the other day, and hey, listen, I can't. I couldn't. You know, I. I can't do it. To, to my great. Chagrin. Chagrin. Sadness. The French word. My grieving. Mm. You know, I can't eat donuts like I used to. Mm. I have a sugar problem. Probably because of all the blooming donuts I've eaten for the years. Uh, you had too gosh, many. man, let me tell you, you used to go and get three, four of those things, and when they're hot, the you just you pop them in. Before you'd even take a breath, they're you could eat air. those things. Yeah, it's like taking a breath. You oh, just breathe in gosh. the Krispy Kreme and breathe out endless joy mm, mm, and insulin. Mm. I have got, yeah, and insulin. That's right. I have got to do a sermon. When, you know, Spurgeon did a whole series of on sermons just on candles. Yes, I've, yes. I've said that before. You know, somebody challenged him, and he said, all right, just give me a, an idea, and I can do illustrate. And they said candles. And there's an entire little booklet on Spurgeon sermons where he uses the illustration of candles. I need to do a sermon series where I use nothing but either Krispy Kreme or Mayberry. Well, let's do it for your... Um Let's do it for your Wednesday night series this summer. You're going to do it starting in a couple of weeks, right? Am I? Not me. Oh, yeah. that's Ruth. right. Yeah, they're tag teaming it. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? That's I'm glad you said that, Joe, because I was thinking when I'm through with Peter, uh, I thought I might go to Ruth. Uh, but if they're, they're doing, doing that Wednesday on Wednesday night, nights, yeah. I need to go back and pray. I've thought about Ruth. I've thought about Esther. Oh, that's another cool one. Yeah. Boy, you talk about an incredible woman. Now, Esther was an incredible woman. Well, if you realize who she was married to and the awesome power that God uh, that guy had. Yeah, he was kind and of what a God does yeah. in the midst of that whole situation. That's a Well, the book is written so dramatically, too. The oh, irony yeah. and everything, it's Yeah. It's it really fascinating. Is. It is a fascinating. I'm glad we decided your next sermon series right Well, here. I don't, you know, spot. maybe. I don't know. I, I, I'm really kind of, I've really been praying through that. What do I do? Do I go? And I've had the fruit of the Spirit on my mind. I thought that would be something really good and light to go through the, that would be great. you know, through the summer. Uh, I don't know. So pray. Pray that the Lord will 
show me where to go. And you're talking about summer of 22 because you're going to be in First Peter. No, no, for no, like no. I'm going to wind up First Peter here in the next number of weeks, I think. Oh, okay. So. Okay, great. Well, I've got. So, are you ready to get to the text? Because there's a lot to talk yeah, about with I regards am. to this. I'm, Let me get I'm my ready. commentary down. Here. This is un- so unusual. There, this was just a really difficult text this week. There was a lot to go through. Oh, Lord, I have mercy. Look at all this stuff he's got here. <laughs> this is just a prop. I just... Uh, but Culver, there... do you like Culver, his systematic theology? You know, somebody gave this to me. I've just, I've used it sparingly. What's your, I, I, what's your well, opinion? Well, I think it's fine. You know, there are, there are a number of good ones out there. These are you know, sus- I if, should turn if these you around, you don't get into the Calvinist debate, you know... And everything determines, yeah, you know, even it. who you read. There, there's some great God. Frame did a great job here on the yes. doctrine of God. I had that one um, was for, yeah. And you can read with balance. I like Erickson's um, systematic. I like, uh, what's his name? Um, Grudem. Grudem's. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, and of course, I love Dr. Ryrie. Nobody could say things as succinctly. I can't I believe. I can't believe what? I am so proud of you what? to see to see you with those systematic theologies and well I I, I think I there's grab... a tear in my eye. <laughs> I know. Look at that. Six months ago, you finally got me to get a wow. Bible, and wow. now, now he's and got now a Bible, look, and now he's got some systematic systematic theolo- theologies. I did have to get the commentary out. I think I told you I got when you started preaching um, First Peter. I got Shriner's commentary. Yeah, um, yeah, of which is uh, brilliant. Theologian, yeah. And so, yeah, I just, I I went to the old, for for our fellow students of the word out there, the Best Commentaries website. Have you seen that before? It's like bestcommentaries.com. It's like a, it's been on the web for like years and years, and uh, guys go through and they'll like rate whether they like a different commentary for different reasons. They'll talk about where it kind of falls spectrum of theology. I actually had a guy suggest a commentary on 1 Peter that I bought last week, had him rush it to me uh, so I could look at this passage, and um, it was a little disappointing. Uh, It was not, it was not, now it may be stronger in, other areas. you know, like in chapter four or five, or it may have been stronger in chapter one. Commentaries are that way. That's why you, you can't buy just one commentary Definitely on a book not. and that's it, you know, because there are weaknesses and their strengths and their pluses and their minuses. It's, it's hard to find one that's even all the way through. Yeah, that's, that's true. Well, I, I know that that's, and, and even for the, the totality of Scripture, that's why in a commentary series they have different people with different specializations. Yeah, yeah. and lie. even buying series... Uh, you know, they're uneven as well. That's right. That's why I focus more on just a, a book. You know, who would you buy? Let's just say, who would you buy on Hebrews? Well, hands down, I don't think there's anybody that can touch uh, David Allen on Hebrews. Um, you know, and then there are others. He's also your preaching professor, isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, he is. But he, he is probably the foremost expert today on Hebrews than anybody living. Well, we'd love to hear you preach on Hebrews. That would be a, That would be great. Now that would be a multi-year. Yeah, it's it's deep. Yeah. There's a lot do you there. do you know that Dr. Allen says he believes that Hebrews was written or very possibly written as a sermon that it was to be it I've heard intended that to be just read through. You know. Well, it makes sense because because you can read it out loud. Is it like fifty minutes or so? Like if you read yeah, it out loud yeah. at a normal pace, it, it matches the yeah you know matches the the length of a sermon. That is really interesting. It may I mean it, and it's obviously very cohesive. But uh, wait, are we talking about Hebrews or First? Yeah, Peter? we're in First Peter. Now, um, so you started the message, and I guess before we get to the text proper, you started the message, and you said that this text, you know, spirits in prison, times of no, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the three hardest texts yeah. in the New Testament, I wanted to guess. I wanted to make a guess as okay, to what, well, guess. what your what other are ones the, are. Oh, you want to guess, or you want me to just I'm going to get. Well, okay. you'll tell us yeah, eventually, tell but me. I'm going to guess. Okay. And the first one I thought of was 1 Corinthians 11. The head That's covering. exactly right. That's yes. one of the ones that I would have gone to, because that is kind of a difficult passage. What exactly is Paul talking about here? Hold on, I'm still posing. In like you women, y'all need to go and get a hat and put on, please. Yes, 
lady. Yeah, there's there's multiple women in this room that don't have a head covering on. I know. But that's it's, and I've I've read some more commentaries on that, and that might actually have a small connection even to our text today, because yeah. he says that because of the angels. But we'll get to that. Okay. And the other text that I thought of is Revelation chapters four through twenty-two. Revelation is just really really difficult. <laughs> So just all no, of Revelation. No, Revel, that's not so hard to me. Let me I tell know. you what I think is difficult. Okay. We're talking about Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6 is a kind of difficult. Yes, very uh, good. The whole loser salvation debate yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, what's going on What's going on here? What's going on with that? The other, you know, now that's the New Testament. Okay, there are three that are in the New Testament right there. And you'd have to come to the end of Mark. Is that a gloss? Um, what's in there, this whole deal of picking up snakes and well, I uh, thought that that I thought that po- wasn't in the original manuscripts. So drinking anyway. poison. Well, you know, what do you do with it then? Yeah. I, th- then you've also got the, uh, uh, the the woman that was the caught John, in adultery. Yeah, that's the that's other a one. difficult that thing. But you go back, and I make reference back to Genesis chapter six. That's a very difficult passage. Very difficult. You know, there's just not many words there. They describe this situation, yeah. and you're like, wait, mm-hmm. did I read that right? Wait, yeah. what are you, yeah. really? Um, yeah. So, but now that's Old Testament. Of course, there's a, there are a number of passages in the Old Testament. But I do think that First Peter chapter 3, 18, 19, 20, you know, and it's not just difficult theologically. It is very difficult st- structurally. Yes. Because it's like, it's like, it's like talking to your great aunt and she starts talking about you know her son who went to buy a truck and oh you know by the way that Ford pickup reminds me of so and so over here and do you know his niece did this that or oh and by the way while we're talking about her you go back but oh let me get back to the truck right you know that kind and so it's kind of like all these parenthetical statements that are uh, and these clauses that are in there that and make they, it very difficult structurally. And they know exactly what they're talking about. They do. And you're like, obviously. Wait, and, yeah. and then you're saying, wait, I'm, I'm having trouble following yeah, this. Yeah, just kind of working through it. Do you think that the original readers of this text immediately understood what he was saying? Probably pretty much, yeah. I, I agree with you. Probably pretty much because, that they did. Well, and what I read was that, are you being serious? Yeah. Okay, yeah. because what I read was like he's he's saying this as a matter of course based on like Jewish tradition, what they understand from other yeah. texts like Enoch and that sort of well, thing. Well, that's like the writer I go back to Hebrews again. Yeah. All of this stuff that he's dealing with ceremony and ritual and all of that, he obviously expects all of his readers to understand what he's talking about there. Otherwise he would have explained it more. Yeah. Right. You know, it was it was obvious common knowledge to them. And I think that he wrote it before the fall of the temple. In uh, 70. In 70, because he never mentions it. But he's re- making reference to all of this ceremony, all of this ritual, that kind of stuff. So Peter writes this. He says, um, he talks about Christ proclaiming his victory to the spi- in, in the Spirit, mm-hmm. proclaiming his uh his, his victory to the spirits in prison uh, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the yeah. ark was being yeah. prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through. Wow. So uh, you explained to us, and I, now, that this was one of the, the more uh, more tight messages you've ever had to do just because of the situation yesterday. You had to right. run, but I thought it was wonderful how quickly you were able to point us in the right direction. Well, you know, I had uh, I had a couple of preachers write me in the uh, the previous week saying, "Okay, we know you're headed here, and how are you going to handle this text, and what are you going to do, and here are options." And yeah. uh, and listen, the options are endless. They're endless. Yeah. And, and the fact of the matter is, preaching is not getting up and presenting all the options to your people. <laughs> um, Sometimes that's an appropriate thing to do. Yeah. We, you've got one or two little, hey, this is interesting, that's interesting, this is where we settle. And that's what all of us want. That's what we wanted in a seminary classroom is, right. okay, you give us all these options, why don't you tell us the one that you think and why you think it is this one or the other. In fact, one of my mentors, uh, I had preach on this passage at the pastor's conference in Jacksonville, and he is totally opposite of where I am. 
And I had to wrestle. You know, we walked out of there really? that day, and my wife said, okay, that's not what you believe, so what do you do with it? Hmm. Uh, we, all, we always want to know, well, what do you believe? Why do you believe that kind of deal? So that's what I did yesterday. As I said, let me just boil this down, walk you through it to, in, a, in a way that I understand what's taking place here and what happened. So well, and and what and I thought you did what you did. I thought was very wise, very pastoral. You said here's a here's a large view that I believe is really wrong. The whole thing that like you yeah. get a second chance at salvation yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah. Again, Hebrews has been pointed for all men to die once, then comes the judgment. So like that doesn't line up. Man, we're getting a lot of Hebrews references today. Yeah. So and then you walk through what this actually means, and it's very very grounded um, in the Old Testament. But you have to you have to like you're saying follow a follow a thread back. We jumped to Genesis chapter 6. Mm-hmm. We saw that these spirits, in fact, were evil spirits, and we saw that God, um, and I never heard this perspective before, but it makes perfect sense, that the, the ultimate wickedness of the world that God saw as man was about to destroy himself actually came from this strange intermarriage of Yeah, demons, I, I wouldn't demons. say uh, that's the only sin I, i'm i he says they are man's thoughts are just continually wicked you're right okay and my lord what about today you know <laughs> good night it's like that old statement of billy graham you know if god you know doesn't do something to america he's gonna have to call sodom and gomorrah up and apologize to him <laughs> uh, that's old school uh, um oh my goodness but yes yeah, so yeah, yeah it was just it was just Man's just absolute wickedness, his hungering after, his going after, his groping after sin. Um, and then this going on, this demonic activity that was going on that would um, uh, pollute the human line, genome. Genome. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, and you isn't, talk- that, isn't that funny that we look back and we can see it was obvious to them, to Satan, to demons, about the human DNA and all of that. Right. That's kind of wild. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, you, we just thought we just came up with it. Well, you talked that about that yesterday, how God says, okay, from the seed of woman and the virgin birth, but right. from, for, from the line of man, yeah. there will be born the Savior. And Satan says, mm-hmm. oh, okay, no problem. I'm just going to completely pollute the line of yeah. man. He, he keeps trying every way he can. He tries it this way and that way and the other way. He's constantly trying to get at that line that he knows. Now, Satan does not know everything. Very important point. Um, Demons do not know everything. I I think that their ability to know the future is very limited, just like ours. But they are shrewd and they are tremendous students and uh, far better at deductive reasoning than you know, man. So he knows that this is coming and he's going to do everything he can to stop that strain, to stop that line, to stop that. Well, and you, and you, I I listed them off. You made, you, you took us to basically 10 points along the way where Satan directly intervened, was allowed to directly intervene and try to stop that. I'm going to let the people listen to the message to hear all of those different points along the way. What I wanted to ask you, and I texted this to you as well, I think it's very interesting that when when this when this intermarriage happens and you have these half demon half people, mm-hmm. the Bible calls them you know the men of old who were of renown. You know yeah, other yeah. Uh, they're referred to as the Nephilim in other Nephilim. places. No, well, Nephilim. God sends a flood. Yes, and so this is a logical problem to me. God yeah. sends a flood, and it says multiple times there's only eight people that survive mm-hmm. the flood, mm-hmm. and yet. Mm-hmm. You get later, in the book of Joshua, they go send spies in the land. Behold, there are giants in the land. Well, you don't have to get that far, oh, Kirkwood. Okay. You can get to Deuteronomy chapter 2. And in Deuteronomy chapter 2, you've got uh, these that are called Rephaim, uh, oh. which is an interesting Hebrew word meaning shade or shadow, these shadowy figures. You know, you almost wonder do they call them that because they cast. Such an incredible shot. I don't know. You know who knows? You don't know. In, in chapter 2 of Deuteronomy, you're going to come across various names. Uh, and the Avim, who lived in villages as far as Gaza. I see this now. Okay. The Kaftorim, who lived, you know, destroyed them, lived in their place. 
And out of this, you've got, uh, oh, where's that passage? The Anakim, verse 21, right. but the Lord destroyed the, uh, before them, the Anakim. Um, there are various names that you've got for these people who are giant. You get over to Og. You remember Og, Shehan and Og? I do. Og's bed, they said, was... So long. It was like 13 feet, 6 inches. When I was in college, I think I told you this the other day, I slept in um, <laughs> Stitch <laughs> Moore's bed. You did tell me that. <laughs> uh, he was like six nine or something like that, and I got his bed in the dorm room. I got his old room, and my gosh, his bed stretched from here to there. It was like the bed of Og, you know, thirteen feet six inches. Um, now, where did they come from? That all I can say is this: they are not the descendants of those back in Genesis six because they, they were be. destroyed. This obviously is a was a genetic, I don't know what you would call, that just was in some of the line there that yeah. these people were strong. You come down to Goliath. I think Goliath was almost 10 feet tall. Well, he's in the line of a knack, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, he was so, very tall. And, and, and all you can do today, you go and look. I think it's the Dinka tribe in Africa. Um, in fact, I've met with the ambassador from uh, the Dinka oh, tribe, the very fine Christian young man. Cool. Uh, but they are good. Lord, they're giants. They are tall. It's just all of them. Yeah. And I think, you know, they're just in in line. They're just some people that, you know. I think that's really interesting. I mean, because you can see, get back to the whole G- Geno thing, you could see how it's kind of recessive. Because by the time you get to Goliath, yeah. there in, is it Samuel? Mm-hmm. First Samuel they're talking about. By the time you get to Goliath, like, He's, it's very notable that there is a giant, yeah. as opposed to this time much earlier, hundreds of years earlier. There's lots of giants, yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. and eventually they sort of die off. Whatever that gene is, it doesn't, it doesn't persist. Very yeah. interesting. Wow, thanks for helping me, uh, helping me understand that. I guess part of that I was confused just because, like, like you were saying, in Genesis 6, I mean, the men of renown, it's actually difficult to tell what their characteristics even were. That, that I was about to say... Uh, that very thing we 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 really kind of struggle over what were they exactly like we don't have any real reference point to say uh, they look like this they look like that um, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days after when the sons of God came to the daughters of men they bore children them those mighty men who were of of old they saw the wickedness. Uh, let's see. Does it even call them giants? It doesn't. It doesn't. So I'm you just see, they don't even it. call them giants there. They were mighty men uh, who were of old men of renown. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't, they were famous, that they were noteworthy, that they were popular, that they were well-known, that they did acts of um, goodness, unbelievable, or unbelievable strength or feats of strength. Sure. That's what it's, is meant by men of renown. So it could mean a number of different things. I think for some reason, somewhere, we've kind of read into it that they were giants. Well, they were, they were, they were half demons for sure. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I love that old joke of, uh, you know, the preacher who. Uh, the church, church was going on, and the devil broke into the back door and came running down the aisle, and all the people just went screaming, tearing out, running, except for the preacher, you know. When the, the devil pre- looked at him and said, aren't you afraid? And he said, no, I've been married to your sister for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So I don't know. We don't know, you know, what what they were like. Did Chris they were so, the No. They were somehow demonic. They were somehow... Uh, men of tremendous wickedness. I, maybe that's what is meant by the the whole concept of renown. So uh, earlier, uh, back, back to the uh, First Peter three. Now this is again, and you you you, you cross referenced um, what what was happening in the book of Jude because you talked about yeah. how he really draws on sources that we would call extra biblical. That is, they're outside the canon of scripture. And, yeah, well, and, the word for hell that is used here, or the word for deep prison p- pit prison uh, that's used in uh, chapter 
3, uh, verse 19, that's extra biblical. It was a word that was used in Homer. I think Homer uses it. Um, it's used in Greek mythology. It was the place where the Greeks in their mythology said uh, these wicked gods were kept. That is fascinating. And so yeah. Peter repurposes it. Yeah. Um, and he's implying... Tra- Traitaro is the word. And he's um, implying that there's different yeah. circles, so to speak, of hell? Tartaro. I'm sorry. Tartaro is the word. Well, it, it in, in Greek mythology, it is this deep pit down in hell. It, it, we think in terms of Milton's paradise right. uh, loss or the divine... Inf- Infer- Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno right. of the pits of hell or the levels of hell. That word... Tartaro means a deep, dark pit. And the Greeks said that's where these um, gods that got out of control who were excessively wicked were put. Evidently, Zeus put them there. You know, he, he confined them to those pits. So it's- and so the, the Jews had reached into that and picked up that word, that concept, and used it. Used it, and so... Paul was fam- uh, Peter was familiar with the term, and he used the term. That's fascinating. Yeah, and in fact, in Second Peter, you can go to Second Peter, and he's still That's talking where I was about going this. Next. Yeah, Second Peter chapter two, where he comes and he says, "For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness." There, we're we're told he's a preacher of righteousness, and a flood upon the world. Uh, uh, the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They, anyway, they are again, there's another reference, and you do get over to Jude, and in Jude, um, verse 6, only chapter, he speaks of this, angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. They evidently morphed Changed, took on the appearance of man because we get all the implication of scripture is that angel angels are um, I, I don't know the proper word asexual non sexual right you mentioned that they yesterday. do not procreate they do not they're not in my, and so they obviously had to change their abode they had to change their form their form. And I use the express. They morphed yes, into. They took place. on human appearance, uh, in order to pollute and, and destroy uh, humanity, for the purpose of keeping the Messiah from coming. Well, and they were unsuccessful. And I think that's yes. probably where we where we need to conclude because this demonology is is fascinating. And obviously, this is what the Scripture teaches. But the whole point of that text was that Christ has a victory to proclaim. Yes. And so he, there is victory over evil. He pops he pops down wherever that is. The spirits in prison says, by the way, guys, I won. I won. And y'all are still here. Yep. I still have complete yep. lordship yep. over you. I couldn't help but think of uh Carmen's uh Sundays on the way. Hmm. You know, when they, when he talks about what is it? The stone was rolled away and it bounced a time or two, then an angel stepped inside and said, Yo, I'm Gabriel. Who are you? <laughs> what does he say? If you're wondering where the Lord is at this very hour, I tell you he's alive and well with resurrection power. Man, Carmen, he God was rest so his bad. soul. Wasn't he? he was so good. I'll never was... get beyond. What is the one where he's the cowboy? You know, <laughs> He has the shootout with the demon, the <laughs> devil. I love that. You hear all this theme song music from Bonanza yes. in the background. <laughs> it's the other one where he's the boxer and he's like, you know, fighting with the, it's it's unbelievable. You yeah. got if it, for any young people that are listening to this and you don't know who Carmen is, you need to get on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, get on YouTube. And, and you need to understand it. what real Christianity is all about. You got anything good. else you want to talk nope. about? Have a good week. Yeah. Glad we got you warmed up. <laughs> you need to get back to playing in your Mayberry se- series. <laughs> yep. Just the uh I mean, gosh, you could do a sermon on every episode. You know, there's a whole Sunday school series out on it. On did Mayberry. you write it? No, I did not. Now, I think that's taking it maybe a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> we got, finally, we get this. Are this still recording? Yep. It always is. It's always recording. Man, that was fun. Thanks for answering Good. those Can questions. Good. Can y'all pick me up and carry me back to my office? <laughs> I saw you last night. I was like, man, poor guy. Poor old. uh, 
No. You were tired. Jeff asked me, he said, Pastor, you, you want to come and lap this up? No. <laughs> 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 <laughs>